you know, traditionally we would have learned this from from our uncles and um, our from our mother's side, and um, you know, and that's where we would have learned uh, how to make dugout canoes and everything else that we'd learn important in life. Um, but um, you know, for some of us, some of that knowledge. Um, that chain of knowledge is broken down somewhat, so we have to go to other tribal members that might not necessarily be your direct uncle, but it's, you know, we still kind of all consider each other family, at, you know, at kind of on a general level. Hi, today we're here at the Atathigi Museum at the Big Cypress Seminole Reservation with Pedro Zapeta, who is a tribal member and a, a Seminole artist and craftsman and historian. And uh, Pedro is going to talk to us today about the cultural significance and the history of the dugout canoe uh, to southeastern uh, native people and particularly the Seminole. Uh, so Pedro, we appreciate you uh, meeting us here today. We're fascinated to learn more about your your dugout canoe that you have there. And uh, could you just tell us a little bit about the, the history of, of dugout canoes to Seminole people uh, and about their cultural significance? Sure. Um, so for dugout canoes, you know, they've always been a really important part of the Seminole tribe and, you know, Southeastern Native peoples. Um, and for the Seminole tribe specifically, um, we've never stopped making dugout canoes. We've always used and made them and continue to, to make them today. Um, so since we've been using them for so long, they're, you know, I would say a very integral part of our culture and our history um, throughout time and through today as well. And so historically, these this was one of the primary means of transportation, uh, certainly in South Florida in the wetlands and the Everglades. Mm -hmm. Um, you're, you're with a canoe that you carved. Uh, tell us about that canoe, what it's made of and how you made it, where you found the tree, you know, uh, for someone who's not familiar with dugout canoes, how does this all work? Um, so yeah, just as the name says, it literally is a tree that is dug out. Um, you know, again, it's a little more complex than that, but you know, very basically, you know, you take a tree and shape it and, and dig out the inside and you hollow it out to make uh, the shape of the canoe. Um, so for me, I get um, my logs from here on the Big Cypress Reservation. You know, we do have a, a very large reservation. We do have some large trees out here. Um, that's one of the toughest parts of making these canoes is trying to find the, the raw material of a, of a large uh, old growth cypress to make them because um, most of them were harvested out of the state. Um, but when I do find one, and I do find ones that have already fallen naturally due to a storm or other natural causes, um, I'll, you know, remember where those trees are and come back to them when it's, um, you know, convenient to, to carve them out. Um, so the trees that we do use are cypress. Um, their ages tend to be, for a dugout canoe, anywhere from 200 to 350 years old. So very, very old trees. And... Um, you know, there's several reasons we use cypress, um, you know, several qualities um, for dugout canoes. You want the tree to be straight, you want it to grow large, and to have few or little knots in the wood. Um, and cypress, you know, achieves all of those characteristics. Um, and it has an additional, you know, plus of being um, rot resistant and insect resistant um, because of the natural oils in the wood. Um, so all these things together make it a really great choice for making dugout canoes. So Pedro, tell us a little bit about the physical shape of the canoe. It's long and slender. What I notice it's got a kind of a knife-like uh, shape up front to the bow and, and, and a little bit more blunt at the stern. What, what is the functionality of some of those design features? So our dugout canoes, um, you know, we don't really know what our you know, early dugout canoes look like as uh, it's such a utilitarian item. They don't necessarily survive through time, um, just as other things that are well used oftentimes don't get preserved. And uh, so we know what our dugout canoes have looked like for about the past 120 years or so, and they've been, have changed very little in that time. Um, so they do have this very pointed um, knife-like bow or nose of the canoe. 
um, and this really helps a lot with going through the sawgrass in the open Everglades um, because the water in the Everglades is very shallow um, for a lot of the year and so this um, shape of this bow helps part the grass and keep you in the water instead of riding up on top of the grass. Um, if you get in more open water or where there's a more uh, strong current, you can use the, the rear or the stern of the canoe and uh, you know so it'll catch less of the current and waves and things like that um, as you're going along so it'll be easier to steer that in the, in the more open water of uh, or something that has current. Yeah, so yeah, you can use the, the canoe either way. Um, you know, we, we do stand on the on a platform that's on the, the canoe here, and we use a push pole to propel the canoe, um, unless the water is too deep, and then, then we use a paddle. Um, but most often, uh, especially in South Florida, the water tends to be pretty shallow um, that we can use a push pole most places. And Pedro, I've seen some old photographs from the early part of the 1900s where the, uh, the canoes were actually rigged with small sails. Mm -hmm. So in open water, you could even use a sail, although that's more rare. Um, yeah, I mean, over time, the sails were used less and less. Um, but at one point, they were relatively common. Um, and the types of sails that we use were either a, uh, it's called a gaff rig or a sprit rig. And those are two types of sails that I've seen. Again, I've only seen those in historic photos because um, it's probably been maybe 70 years or so since we've uh, done sailing with our canoes. Um, so again, at one point it was more common, but today uh, it's very less common. So the sails maybe would have been kept in the boat and only really used if the conditions were right, if you were in open water, or the wind was coming from the right direction, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and I have seen uh, some photos of uh, people using, of Seminoles using dugout canoes with the sails, uh, even in the canal, so I think if the, the wind was just right, you could even use it in a narrow canal. Sure, would save you a lot of work, I imagine. So this one really isn't a usable size for an adult. Um, this would make a good children's canoe though. Okay. Um, and just like any other transportation, we have different sized canoes depending on what the purpose of that canoe is. So we make, you know, as small as a children's canoe to as large as a 30 foot um, family canoe where you can load your whole family in, you can put in, you know, all your goods and go to the trading posts. Um, you know, if you need camping supplies, if you're going to go visit other family members, you know, if they're several days away by, by canoe. Um, and then we have kind of medium sized ones that can hold two or three people and, you know, maybe just going fishing for the day or a couple of men are going hunting, um, you know, to catch whatever and bring it back to the camp. Um, so we kind of have small, medium, and large canoes, depending on, on what we need it for. The way I do it, and the way most people do with dugout canoes, you start actually by shaping the outside of the canoe first. Um, and it's pretty important to do that because once you start digging out the inside, you need to know how deep to dig the canoe. Um, so the outside shape of the canoe is dictating how deep the inside is going to be instead of the other way around. You don't want to start digging the inside and then work on the outside and decide, oh, I took too much out and now I can't make the outside of the canoe shaped correctly. Um, so it's really important to start on the outside of the canoe, get that pretty well along before you really start digging out the inside of the canoe. Um, you know, these trees, you know, have moisture in them from being alive. Um, or even if the ones that I get that have fallen in the swamp 10 years ago, they'll still have water in them because they've been sitting in the swamp. Um, you know, so, you know, you're also trying to slow the drying as much as possible to prevent cracking. Um, it is a large piece of wood, so no matter what, you're going to get some cracking. You're just going to, you're trying to mitigate the amount of cracking that is happening on the canoe so you don't get it too much on there. Um, and so, you know, so if several ways of trying to slow that down from covering it with you know leaves or wood shavings or canvases and tarps um, you know I've even used different kinds of paints and things to paint over certain parts of the canoe um, to especially parts that um, you know have the end grain of the wood more exposed like on, on the part of the bow here uh, while I'm carving on it I might uh, put a thin layer of paint at the end of the day just to 
you know, again, slow that drawing down until I can come back and finish working on it. Because what we're, we're talking about is if it dries too quickly, then the wood tends to check or crack. Yes. I see. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, it was, you know, wood is a natural thing and it, it doesn't dry evenly. So some parts will dry quicker than others. And so the parts that dry quicker are going to contract more than the parts that haven't. So since they're literally, you know, becoming smaller and other parts are larger, something's going to give at some point. And so again, if you can do it as even as possible, then you're reducing your chances of having larger splits and cracks. And Pedro, these are, these are modern dugouts, obviously, uh, done in the traditional manner. But they are they are beautiful. Uh, this one in particular is a lovely example, and and so it's almost an artistic piece. But like you mentioned earlier, these were utilitarian kind of everyday driver type vehicles, mm -hmm. and so if they had some cracks or if they warped a little, they didn't have to be necessarily beautiful and perfect. They just needed mm -hmm. to work originally. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know all those old canoes ended up with you know different patches or repairs on them at some point, you know, or um, you know the sun got to them or or whatever, and so um, you know for in living memory the most common patch has been tar and tin. <laughs> right, we have a canoe in the Silver River Museum on display that was carved by uh, Charlie Cypress, mm -hmm. uh, who who was a tribal member who would come up actually from Big Cypress. Uh, and his, he and his family would come up to the tourist camp uh, at Silver Springs and he would demonstrate canoe carving for tourists. Uh, but we have one of his canoes in the museum and it does in fact have old uh, roofing tin patches on the boat, uh, a lot on the bottom of the boat and up front mm -hmm. to kind of keep the cracks under control. Uh, and I imagine that, that the boat that we have on display was probably carved in the 40s or possibly the 50s. Yeah, yeah, and you know, most commonly crack, um, you know, radiating out from the heartwood of the tree from the very center. So usually along the center line of the, the bow or the center line of the stern, which this one does have one on the stern, you know, coming right out from the, the very pith of the tree. You know, I do consider myself a modern carver, um, modern canoe carver. Again, you know, we've always done um, dugout canoes, and so because of that, we've added different uh, tools over the years. So, you know, 400 years ago, when we came in contact with Europeans, they brought steel tools. And so we immediately began using steel tools to start carving with. It was much better than the shell and stone tools that we previously had. Um, and then you come up to more modern times, we've added things like a chainsaw and an electric hand planer to help um, carve these canoes. But there's still a lot of um, hand tools that still need to be used to, to carve these dugout canoes. Um, you know, a lot of times a chainsaw is replacing something a crosscut saw would have done in the past. Um, you know, so, you know, power tools can speed up some parts of the canoe carving. Um, but other parts, you know, especially when you get close to the end, um, you know, power tools can, you know, become a hindrance because they they might remove too much wood too quickly. Um, and so, again, once I get close to the end, I switch to exclusively hand tools to, to finishing this. Um, but a lot of the heavy wood removal, I do a combination of a chainsaw and an axe to remove a lot of the bulk of the, the wood off of these canoes. You have to take quite a bit of wood away from the tree trunk to get to that canoe shape. Yeah, yeah, you end up with a lot of uh, tree guts next to, <laughs> next right. to the canoe. Right, and we see plenty of wood chips and chunks laying around. Uh, we're under a, a chicky here at the, uh, at the museum, at the, at the village, the cultural village, and it looks like a place where people have worked on canoes in the past. Yeah, you know, and I do try to get as much um, usable wood off of the canoe as possible when I'm carving it. Um, you know, so I will use chainsaw mills to do um, some of the flat sides of these canoes, and that way I can get, you know, a couple boards off the top and the bottom of the canoe, um, you know, so I'm not wasting um, unnecessarily parts of these, you know, two and three hundred year old trees, and I can use those boards for like the planks or building other things um, as well, or um, some people, have, you know, I've given some wood to people and make canoe paddles and things like that. Um, you know, so like if I wasn't using that chainsaw mill, then that would have would have just been chopped up into little pieces and been unusable. And so we're able to, you know, use more parts of these logs um, because of you know modern tools. 
Um, yeah, so how I came to learn to make dugout canoes is um, been a bit of a, a journey for myself. You know, it's been a combination of uh, learning from people and you know doing my, some of my own research and um, you know doing studying of other dugout canoes. Um, you know, at different museums and stuff as well. Um, you know, growing up Seminole, you know, we do see dugout canoes, you know, in different places that are, you know, you know, we were like here at the museum, we have several canoes here that, you know, you know, that weren't made by me that are just here, um, or, and we have some fiberglass replicas, uh, molded off originals that we have. So, you know, growing up Seminole is something that you do see, um, but unfortunately these days you don't see made too often anymore. And, um, you know, so... When I was about 14, I really started getting interested in learning our traditional arts and especially um, our traditional arts that weren't being done so much anymore. Um, and so my older brother, Brian, he's uh, kind of the same way. And uh, so he's kind of an inspiration for me as well to, to start learning some of these different traditional arts. Um, so when I was about 19 is when I really started learning about dugout canoes um, for my brother, Brian and because uh, he was um, getting into learning about them as well and uh, so we worked on a few together and um, later on I learned uh, as well from my uh, uncle Leroy Osio I learned a little bit from him as well um, and then a lot of trial and error too you know and um, I always like to say I, I don't consider myself a master canoe carver I, I you know well aware that I know more more than you know, most, most other people around today, you know, um, but I also know that I'm not as good as my grandparents' generation would have been at making dugout canoes as well. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm getting close to that, but uh, I'm not quite there yet. So, so you also carve other things like spoons and, and small models and um, stick ball sticks and, and other traditional seminal items that are made out of wood as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do like carving uh, other things as well. And, um, you know, because, again, I feel like a lot of these uh, traditional items are, are important to our culture. Um, because um, in a lot of native cultures, not just for seminal culture, but these objects are not simply objects. They are carriers of our culture. They have traditional knowledge associated with them. Um, you know, and sometimes special language that's associated with these objects. Um, and then also what I call um, cultural protocol and etiquette. And um, so it's, you know, things like who can make certain objects or at what, um, you know, certain life points that you get to, you know, whether you have you know, children or married or widowed or things like that. And certain people are, um, learn different things at those points in their lives. And uh, so again, so these objects have a lot of knowledge associated with them other than strictly being a, a beautiful object. And, you know, they have all this other um, associated information with them that's important to, to the culture. So I think people lose that in today's kind of disposable culture where you go to the store and you buy something and you might own it for six months and really no thought goes into it. You purchase it. When it breaks, you throw it away and you go get another one. There's not a lot of information that's embedded or sim symb symbolized by that object. Uh, so I suppose canoes are kind of the same way. There's probably a lot of information that's embedded in surrounding that object itself. Yeah, and, you know, unfortunately we have, you know, lost, you know, some of that information over time, you know, and that's why it's important to try and maintain these things so we don't, you know, lose that knowledge that goes along with it. Um, you know, and, and I think one of the things in the past, especially the past 40 years or so, is that even though we've been continuing to make dugout canoes, um, there's been very little use of those dugout canoes. Um, you know, so I'm hoping to get to the point where, um, you know, where we have several canoe carvers that are making dugout canoes and that we can actually s begin to use our dugout canoes again, even if it's something like, you know, a scheduled, um, you know, paddling event or something like that for us to partake in to, to be able to, 
um, maintain, you know, those aspects of, of the culture. You know, it's such an important direct connection to the water. You know, water is so um, important and life-sustaining, you know, for everything on our planet, you know. And, you know, living down in the Everglades, it is exceptionally important to know how to live you know, with the water and to, you know, make use of it and, um, you know, maintain what your elders have taught you about living in this, you know, watery environment that, that we're at in the Everglades. So a lot of people would look at the Everglades and it's foreboding and, 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 and kind of off limits. And um, other people would see it and say, well, that's an easy place to get across. I've got a canoe. I've got the right kind of transportation. It's going to give you food and water and, and, and an easy way to travel, or, or at least an easier way to travel than walking. So it becomes a matter of perspective. Yeah, you know, Florida is, you know, so well known for its waterways. And, uh, you know, so the Florida's waterways were the original highways of the state. And, uh, you know, I think it's still an important part and just important to remember, you know, to, to maintain, you know, what was given to us. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, I think as long as there's been large trees and people together, I think they've made watercraft from them. Right. Um, you know, we have so many stories about, uh, you know, our canoes and the importance to us, and, you know, even, you know, people that visit us from, you know, faraway places that came by canoe that sailed to our lands, you know, and um, so we know it's just been used for, for so, so long. It's been, you know, just so important to surviving. So Pedro, what are your hopes as a, as, as a young man, as, as a tribal member, um, a Native American, and, and a historian, and, a, and, a, and an artist, what are your hopes? Do you, do you want to pass this on? I know that you, you're all about teaching. You've come to the Silver River Museum and done programs for us in the past. Um, but but what, what, is your, what is your ultimate hope, or what are your, what are your goals? But my goal is really, I really hope to maintain and preserve these traditions, um, you know, and hand them down to the next generation. Um, you know, because it's important what our elders have taught us, and again, all the other knowledge you know, that goes along with these things, and, um, you know, what I was told by elders is that, you know, all this knowledge was given to us by, by the birth maker, by the creator, by God, and, you know, it's also a way of, you know, honoring our creators, you know, by maintaining what he has given us, um, the knowledge that he's, he's given us, and to pass that along to, um, our family and our community, and, um, so that's what I really hope to do by, learning and um, relearning some of these things and uh, be able to, to pass those on to, to my children and to other, you know, tribal community members and, um, you know, to be able to teach the public at large, um, you know, a little bit about our culture and, and why it's important to us and why it's important um, for us to, to maintain it.